Okay. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for this introduction and for having organized this session. Uh, my name is Emre Baspinar. Uh, I'm a postdoc in Mat Neuro team from Iriel, Sophia Antipolis Mediterrane. And today I, uh, I'll speak uh, about a part of our joint work with Mathieu Desroches and Daniela Avitabile. It's about elliptic bursting and torus canard in terms of single limits, single cell models, networks, and mean field models. Okay, let me give a brief outline of the whole talk before I start. Uh, initially, I will provide some general information about elliptic bursting in neuronal models. Then I will present a standard canonical model from which we propose by extending it a new canonical model, which we named as a Leidenator. And finally, I will conclude the whole talk. Okay, let's start. Biological systems express uh, different uh, interesting uh, dynamical patterns. For example, resting state. For example, a periodic pattern, tonic spiking. Another periodic pattern, bursting, and in particular, elliptic burstings. And our goal is to provide some models in terms of dynamical systems, which can reproduce those, uh, those dynamical patterns and which we can use in order to analyze such dynamical patterns. And in the modeling framework, we can take advantage of a, a control parameter, which we, which we will denote from now on by K, in order to determine in which regime the model uh, works or functions. For example, in an elliptic uh, bursting system model, we can increase the control parameter K in order to switch from a resting state to a tonic uh, spiking regime or from a tonic spiking regime to an elliptic bursting regime. And especially in this transition region between the tonic spikings and elliptic bursting uh, regime, we observe an interesting family of transitive periodic patterns, uh, torus canards. And those torus canards are of great interest for us because uh, first of all, they're difficult to capture, difficult to be captured. Secondly, they arise in an uh, exponentially small parameter set corresponding to the control parameter K. And finally, those are, uh, those are the patterns which determine, which marks the boundary between, uh, between uh, tonic spikings and elliptic bursting uh, regimes. In other words, they mark the boundary between two neural activity regimes. For this reason, our work, is focus, our work focuses on uh, those transitive patterns, in particular torus canards and elliptic burstings, as well as their constitutive elements. Okay, the simplest theoretical setup for an, for an elliptic bursting system is a, is a three-dimensional uh, OD system, where X denotes, expresses the membrane potential of an excitatory population or exi um, membrane potential uh, of an excitatory uh, single cell. Uh, why the same, but for the inhibitory population in the framework for a single cell, it can be considered as a, as a, as a gate variable as well. And zeta is, this, is a slope recovery variable which arranges the opening and closing of the ionic channels on the, on, the, on the cell membrane. And neurophysiologically, we know that X and Y, I mean, membrane potentials, they evolve, they change on a, on a rather fast time scale in comparison to the slope recover, recovery variable zeta. For this reason, we call X and Y fast variables and zeta the slow variable. And here, F, G and H are sufficiently uh, smooth uh, nonlinear functions and epsilon is a non-zero but sufficiently small perturbation parameter. And it, it determines the ratio between the time scales corresponding to X, Y, corresponding to fast variables, I mean, and uh, the time scale corresponding to the slow variable. We can write this system equivalently in terms of the slow time variable tau by applying a direct time, time uh, rescaling. And these two representations are equivalent as long as the perturbation term is parameter epsilon is not zero. But at the moment we send this perturbation parameter to zero at the limit, at the singular limit, these two representations, <clears throat> they converge to two different limits, which we call fast and slow subsystems. And the typical approach in multiple time scale dynamical systems is to separate the full system into those two subsystems and perform the analysis uh, on those two subsystems instead of the uh, full system itself. This simplifies the mathematical analysis. Okay, the elliptic bursting systems were first studied by uh, Rinzel, where he provided a first formal categorization with uh, several bursting types. Then this was extended by Isikevich, where he explained uh, more bursting types, including the elliptic bursting systems, and also where he provided the links of those bursting uh, patterns to neural behaviors. And um, according to the categorization of Isikevich, 
the bifurcations involving in elliptic bursting uh, elliptic bursting systems uh, are as follows okay here we see the bifurcation diagram of the of the of the fast subsystem of an elliptic bursting system onto which we superimpose uh, an elliptic bursting cycle and of course this elliptic bursting cycle uh, is obtained from uh, from a perturbed system while the bifurcation diagram from uh, from a singular limit from the fast subsystem okay the bifurcations involved in the, in the in 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 an elliptic bursting uh, system is a hopeful bifurcation which triggers the onset of the burstings and the sudden node bifurcation which marks and terminates the uh, the uh, the end of the bursting cycles um, and due to the presence of the saddle node bifurcation here, those elliptic bursting systems, they support what we call torus canards. Okay, later on after Isikevich, Ju, Alexander and Shinnikov, they studied in detail elliptic burstings together with torus canards by using a canonical form, which we name, which we call the standard canonical form. And we depart from these last two studies and extend the standard canonical form in order to be able to capture some new singular elements which are not uh, captured by the standard canonical form. Okay, <clears throat> now let's have a deeper look at the standard canonical model and what we do uh, with the standard canonical form. Okay, we can apply a typical uh, simple co polar coordinate transform on the standard canonical form and we can simplify the system by decoupling the uh, phase variable theta, the phase variable of the oscillations. And in this way, we can ignore theta variable and reduce the dimension of the, of the, sorry, of the system to two dimension. So instead of uh, studying and anal anal analyzing a three-dimensional dynamical system, we can uh, continue with a two-dimensional dynamical system. And in fact, this uh, decoupling of, of this uh, phase variable theta has even more important consequences, consequences, which we will see in a second. And here R represents the radius of the oscillations and Z, zeta, is, uh, is, as in the previous uh, case, uh, the slow recovery variable. <clears throat> okay, then we perform a fast and slow subsystem analysis on this uh, reduced, uh, reduced uh, elliptic bursting uh, system on the reduced standard canonical form. Okay, I mentioned the uh, term singular orbits, singular periodic orbits, or canals, torus canals. Uh, then I think it's a good point to give a description of those structures. <clears throat> by singular orbits, okay, if we consider a simple uh, Van der Poel oscillator and uh, one of the most robust patterns we can observe on it, uh, typical tonic spiking, a singular orbit is a compatible concatenation of fast components, the red ones, with the uh, slow components, the, uh, the, uh, the green ones. When I say fast component, I refer to a part of a solution of the fast subsystem and slow component, the same but for the slow subsystem. And this compatible concatenation should be, should be done in such a way that it should respect the uh, direction of the whole flow. And if we are talking about not only a singular orbit, but uh, a singular periodic orbit, then this concatenation should complete a cycle as well. Okay, if we switch to, uh, to the side of the, uh, side of the standard canonical form, to the side of uh, an elliptic uh, bursting system, things are a bit more complicated. Now, uh, use, uh, the use of only fast and slow components, it's not enough. I mean, we need uh, an additional component, which is uh, highlighted here uh, by the orange colored uh, component. The reason for this requirement is that uh, a typical elliptic bursting cycle, it contains, let's say it consists of uh, three parts. A slow flow, which takes, which, uh, takes uh, place along uh, more or less uh, the critical manifold, which is the horizontal axis. Rapid switches between the slow flow and the uh, slowly drifting oscillations and drifting oscillations, slowly drifting oscillations. Now, the slow flow can be modeled in terms of a slow component and rapid switches can be modeled in terms of the fast components, but drifting oscillations, they cannot because drifting oscillations contain both a fast and slow component. What I mean is that the drift itself is a slow dynamic, uh, slow, uh, an object uh, corresponding to the slow dynamics, while the oscillations are rapid oscillations. They, uh, they correspond to uh, fast dynamics. So in some way, those drifting oscillations, they evolve on an intermediate time scale, which is neither fast nor slow. 
For this reason, we require the use of an additional component, which we call average slow component, obtained from the following average slow subsystem. But when we look at this system, it's funny because it's the system itself. It's uh, here epsilon is uh, sufficiently small. It's not uh, zero. The only difference is that the system is represented in terms of uh, of the slow time variable uh, tau. So in some way, this simple polycoordinate transform by decoupling the theta theta variable averages out the oscillations. In this way, it allows the system itself to define intrinsically an average slow flow, of course, in the part of, the, of, a, of an elliptic bursting cycle, cycle where we observe the drifting oscillations. And in this way, we can, by using intrinsic average slow flow defined by the system itself, we can elaborate the singular orbits. <clears throat> okay, now we can turn back to the simple framework of the, of the Wanda Apollo oscillator. And I would like to say a few words uh, about the description of what, uh, what canard is and what torus canards are. Okay, in the one that oscillator, if we change the control parameter k in such a way that we, uh, we make a closer and closer the k nuke line, this uh, black vertical line, and uh, closer to the folding point, and at a certain point, it coincides with the uh, folding point. Of course, it's not a folding point anymore, but uh, it's a turning point. At this point, at this uh, moment, in an exponentially small uh, parameter set corresponding to the control parameter k, we observe a particular family of uh, singular periodic orbits. These are called canards, and the characteristic of a canard is that it contains a slow flow which starts from a stable object, attracting object. Uh, it starts from the left attra attracting branch of the critical manifold and passes through the turning point and continues along in a, a, a repelling object on the repelling branch of the critical manifold. Instead of making the instant jump at the turning point, it continues along, along a repelling object. So it, it cannot uh, orbits contains, uh, contain a, a component which flows along both an attracting and, and, uh, and a repelling object. Analogously, in the side of a, an elliptic bursting system, now, uh, instead of a slow flow, it is the average slow flow which starts from a stable object, which is the upper uh, branch of stable limit cycles, passes through the saddle node bifurcation, and then it continues along uh, a repelling object, an un unstable object, which is the upper branch of the uh, unstable limit cycles. Okay, uh, and due to the fact that now it is not the fault point, which was the case in the Wander Paul, Paul oscillator, but it is rather the saddle node bifurcation, and we will see in a minute that it can be also the hop bifurcation uh, point, which triggers, which evokes uh, the, uh, the, 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 the canards, canard structures in the elliptic bursting system. We name them uh, torus canards, not only canards, but torus canards. <clears throat> Okay, here in these two examples, we see canard structures with head. Okay, uh, canards with head, they refer to the canard, uh, canard uh, solutions uh, containing two fast components, but they could also contain only one single uh, fast component. And in this case, we classify them as headless canards. Okay, now since we are using an additional uh, subsystem component, average slow component, we should update uh, the description of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a singular periodic orbit. Now, a singular periodic orbit is a compatible concatenation of one or two average slow component with one or two fast component and possibly with one slow component. And it must be done in such a way that as, pre as in the previous case, it should respect the uh, direction of the whole flow. And if we are again talking about a periodic orbit, singular periodic orbit, then the concatenation should complete a cycle. Okay, one subtlety which, uh, which uh, deserves to be mentioned. Sorry. If one of the tip points of a fast component, for example, here P1 and P3, if it's located on an unstable object, here P1 is located on the uh, upper branch of unstable limit cycles, an unstable repelling object, P3 is on the repelling uh, branch of the critical manifold. Then this, the location of this tip point can be chosen arbitrarily on the, on the corresponding uh, repelling object. So we can choose the location of P1 and P3 
arbitrarily on the on the on the on the on the upper branch of the unstable limb cycle or on the uh, repelling part of the critical manifold in other words we have in general infinitely many singular periodic orbits however once we perturb those uh, singular periodic orbits only one of them survives and here i would like to emphasis on the fact that singular periodics or periodic orbits are done by us. I mean, this concatenation is, uh, is done by us, but once we perturb those concatenation, we end up with a real orbit corresponding to the full system, which stays, remains quite close to, uh, to one of those singular periodic orbits from, the, uh, from this family of infinitely many singular periodic orbits. Okay. So I think we can have a look uh, one by one some, some singular scenarios in the standard uh, canonical form. The first one corresponds to the k values, uh, which is which are greater than k s n, which denotes the k value, which makes this k nucleine, this horizontal black line, intersects with uh, these saddle knot bifurcation. Well, here in this first scenario, there is nothing special. The whole flow converts to the stable equilibrium point P three. The corresponding uh, perturbed version is a resting state nothing interesting if we decrease k and fix it to k as n now we have a uh, three possible interesting scenarios now k nuclei passes through the saddle node uh, bifurcation point equilibrium is uh, on on the saddle node the first possible scenario is uh, okay we might have uh, an headless torus canard which is perturbed to uh, an amplitude modulated tonic firing in the time course the other two possible um, scenarios are uh, two different torus canards with head. The first one, in the first one, the average slow flow go passes through the saddle node and continues until the hope bifurcation point, while in the other one, the average slow flow passes through the saddle node bifurcation, but makes the jump before it arrives to the uh, half hope bifurcation. And both of them, when they are, once they are perturbed, they, uh, they correspond to uh, amplitude modulated tonic spikings with silent interruptions. All right, <clears throat> if we decrease a bit more K parameter, we uh, now the K nucleus is between uh, the saddle node bifurcation and hop bifurcation. Well, um, we have an unstable equilibrium. The perturbed version of the, of the following singular periodic orbit is a, is a classical elliptic bursting. If we decrease more and if we fix K to zero, now we have a quite interesting case for us. Um, okay, now the k nucleus coincides with the critical manifold, with the horizontal axis. For this re reason, we have a continuum of equilibrium. So we don't have any periodic structures here. The flow converges to uh, one of the stable equilibrium points, highlighted by P1 here. And the perturbed version is a resting state. But in fact, we know from elliptic, I mean, we observe that in elliptic bursting systems, some periodic uh, structures appear when k is equal to zero some uh, there should be some uh, singular periodic orbits corresponding to this case but the standard canonical form does not capture those singular periodic orbits for this reason we propose a new canonical model Leidenator, which we obtain by introducing this minus alpha zeta term into the standard form where alpha is a positive parameter and in this way we achieve to obtain an inclined k nucleus instead of an horizontal one and this allows us to move the equilibrium point through the Hof bifurcation point. So when k is equal to zero, we don't have anymore a continuum of equilibrium points, which was the case in the standard form, but we have a single equilibrium point, which coincides with the Hof bifurcation. And this allows us to find, capture the singular periodic orbits, which were not be captured by the standard form. And it's an important family of singular periodic orbits. This is, these are a new type of torus scanner which we call mixed type torus canards. And again, as in the previous case, these mixed type torus canards have two versions, headless one, since there's only one fast component and a mixed type torus canard with head since it contains uh, two fast uh, components. Okay. Um, if we look at uh, some examples of classical torus canard, those ones, I mean, those, the, the singular periodic orbits of those type of classical torus canards, they can be captured by also the standard ca canonical form. Um, here on the top row, we see uh, the torus canards in the uh, time course and in the perturbed system, while in the bottom row, we see them in the phase space and in the singular limit. 
where the phase space is represented in terms of the r uh, and zeta coordinates. Hadle's one. Maximum Hadle's torus cannot be called it maximum because the average slope flow uh, takes place until the Hoch propagation point and the uh, torus cannot with hat. As I said, those singular periodic orbits corresponding to those uh, three types of torus canals, they can be captured by both Leidenator and the standard canonical form. But those types, which correspond to the mixed type torus canals, the, um, this, the corresponding uh, singular periodic orbits of this type of torus canals, they can be captured, generated by only, only by Leidenator, not by the standard canonical form. And this is the main contribution which we bring by developing Leidenator. Okay, I will uh, finish by mentioning one, two uh, final things. Okay, I will not talk about too much uh, those models, but what I, would, what, what I would like to say is that this Leidenator didn't fall from the sky. And while we were studying a wilson cohen type mean field and network systems, we obtained those mixed type torus scanner structures. And um, in order to analyze them, in order to understand their construction, when we go back to the standard can canonical form, we realize that in fact, the uh, exact corresponding singular periodic orbits, they were not uh, generated by the standard canonical form. And this is the motivation for us to, be st for us to start to uh, develop further the standard canonical form and uh, yeah, try, to, uh, try to obtain uh, an extended version of it. Leidenator. Okay, that's all. Let me uh, wrap up uh, quickly. Okay, uh, we have seen a new canonical form for elliptic bursting uh, systems, Leidenator. The main characteristic of it, of this uh, canonical form, is, uh, is that uh, it can capture, it can uh, generate new singular elements, which the standard canonical form cannot. And this provides a complete description of singular constitutive elements of of elliptic bursting systems. Okay, thank you for your attention. This concludes my presentation. Now uh, I think I can, uh, I can, uh, I can have your questions. Thank you very much, Emre. Um, there's um, one question from the panelists. Yeah. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on the network uh, simulations that you showed in the end? Um, because I believe you need a network of uh, Wilson Cowan models for the canards to appear, because they don't appear in the single Wilson Cowan model. Okay. Sorry, uh, can I have the question again? So yeah. So um, well, uh, so the so the first question I guess is: uh, Is the canard uh, are the canards that you observe in the network model yeah. are network phenomenon, or would you see them already in the single Wilson Cowan model? Okay. Uh, these kind of canal structures, they were produced in mean field, uh, in mean field models, but it's the first time that we generated them in a network uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the network level. So in fact, okay, we can anticipate, of course, as long as there's this switch in an elliptic bursting system between tonic spikings and the elliptic bursting, uh, elliptic bursting cycles, there should be a transition pattern. And uh, we anticipated that, that there should have been some, there should, uh, have been some kind of structures over there. And some of them were generated already in mean field uh, models, not exactly in this model, which we used, but in some other models. And we as well in the mean field, uh, in the mean field framework, we were able to uh, generate them. But at the network level, it's the first time to our knowledge that uh, such uh, torus canards uh, are generated. So we, yes, in, at the network level, uh, we generated them. And then in fact, we really uh, turned back to the, uh, standard canonical form and started to work from there. Okay, thank you. Um, I do have a probably very naive question for you. Um, the question is, uh, how small does epsilon have to be for the singular limit to still hold? Well, I mean, when we are talking about singular limit, uh, at the theoretical uh, level, it should be really uh, zero. But I mean, practically, uh, when you perform the simulations, of course, it's not possible and the, the, um, the, the, the question how small it should be depends on also uh, uh, how much you change K parameter, the control parameter. But generically, okay. I mean, um, while I was uh, performing the simulations, I was taking epsilon 0 0.001. That was uh, usually the uh, number in order to be able to observe some uh, different types of torus canards. Okay. 